<clears throat> all right then. So a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the uh, midterm, I've posted it. It is currently on Blackboard, uh, Blackboard Moodle. So oh, you can see over here on uh, Moodle, it's at the very bottom. That's the midterm that I finally got it together. Now, because I didn't post it until today, um, you can have a week to do it. You should have it ready by uh, next Thursday at midnight, which means it's the 15th. And it, of course, covers exactly what we did in those first few chapters. In other words, chapters two, three, four, and five, our discussion about international trade. And then um, sooner or later, there'll be another test. But right now, what we're going to do is get back to chapter 12, where we are continuing to analyze how exchange rates are determined in the marketplace, both in the short run and in the long run. Okay, so um, this will probably take up the rest of the class. Next week, um, we'll probably start chapter 13, uh, where we look at other considerations, specifically the central bank and how it affects exchange rates and that type of thing. But right now we're still focused on uh, short-term and long-term determination of exchange rates. All right, now this approach that we're about to look at does involve quite a few graphs as a matter of fact. So we'll be spending a lot of time analyzing graphs here, which is fine because graphs can uh, help us understand very complex ideas with just a handful of curves, which is really the point of graphs to help us uh, summarize a lot of useful information in a very compact way. So uh, previously to this, we looked at some pa uh, parity conditions in the market. These are more long-term factors that influence exchange rates for example, let me just go back and um, oh wow, that sucks. Um, yeah, you better get on that. Ooh, yeah. But as long as you tell, um, give this information to the banks and the uh, and the and the police too, for that matter, uh, you should not be responsible for that. Um, but yes, you have to take care of it right away. So um, right, go go do what you have to do, and I'll see you next time. So anyway, in the meantime, wow, that sucks. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to look and see, uh, remind you what we'd been looking at previously. Uh, we were introducing uh, way in the beginning of this chapter, we looked at supply and demand curves for foreign exchange, but we also introduced several conditions such as purchasing power parity and uh, it's close re relative, relative purchasing power parity. And uh, the point of these is that in the long run, the thinking is that exchange rates should be tightly related to the cost of goods and services in two different countries. The more expensive a country's products are, the weaker should be its currency, because in the long run, the motivation for holding a foreign currency is to uh, buy that country's goods and services. So we also looked at, oh, I guess that was it. So now we're ready for this asset market approach. What's different here is that we're now looking at the short run again. So remember, um, in the long run, we're assuming that exchange rates are primarily determined by the attractiveness of a country's goods and services, including their prices. And in the short run, though, we're thinking of currencies as simply being another type of financial asset that people can invest in. So in other words, if you're an American investor, you may decide that you want to hold British pounds. And what you're primarily going to want to do with them is to buy British financial assets. You might want to buy British stocks. You might want to buy British uh, bonds. But you also may simply want to put your funds in a British bank account and earn hopefully a higher rate of interest after taking into account the exchange rate differential. And so in the long, short run, we're thinking that exchange rates are primarily determined by rates of return rather than the prices of goods and services. Okay, because we're assuming that uh, investors are seeking out the highest possible real rate of return when they decide how to allocate their funds between the domestic currency and the foreign currency. So this is a short-term model that we're looking at here, and it is called the asset market approach to exchange rate determination, because again, we are treating the uh, exchange rate as simply an investment that, um, you know, we will buy or sell depending on what kind of rate of return we can hope to get from it. 
Now, we're going to assume that um, our focus is on what we're going to call the domestic and foreign rates of interest. And um, just to keep it simple, we'll, we'll assume that there's one relevant rate of interest, a very low risk rate of interest. Um, in other words, this is the rate of return you could earn by holding what are called euro currencies. And so the risk is very minimal. So these are more or less risk-free rates of interest. We also have to take into account the current spot exchange rate. And we also have to take into account investors' expectations of where the exchange rate is likely to go in the future. So we're putting together this equation, which shows how the two should be related to each other in equilibrium. The key word here is equilibrium. This is not meant to be an arbitrage relationship. If this relationship is violated in practice, it doesn't mean that you can earn arbitrage profits. What it does mean though, is that you might be able to earn a higher rate of interest or return by moving your funds from one currency to the other. So that's what this is really all about. It's an equilibrium model, as opposed to the ones we saw earlier with triangular arbitrage and interest or covered interest arbitrage. In those cases, any violations of those relationships did in fact lead to arbitrage profits. Here it's a little bit different. This relationship is supposed to hold in equilibrium, but there can be times in which it is violated. Now, of course, if it is violated, we would expect adjustments to take place primarily with the exchange rates themselves, which would bring the relationship back into balance. Okay, so anyway, um, how does this thing work? Well, we'll first start out by defining a few key terms. Number one, uh, E will be the spot exchange rate. And in that case, we'll quote this as so many units of the domestic currency per unit of the foreign currency. <clears throat> and so our, well, not always, but mostly we'll use the dollar and the pound as our example. But we might also choose to use, for example, the dollar and the euro, that kind of thing. All right, so as long as it's dollars per unit of foreign currency, that's what E is meant to represent. And this little E here, this is the observed spot exchange rate. And then EE is the expected that's the magic word there, expected future spot exchange rate. In other words, this is where investors see this exchange rate heading in the future. Now, they may prove to be wrong, but as long as this is what they believe, their investment strategies will be um, directly related to where they expect this currency to look uh, to be in the future. It's like, it's just like buying stocks. Um, why do you buy a stock? Because you expect the price to go up in the future. Now, maybe you're right and you'll make some money. You could also be wrong though, and you might lose money, but the stocks you choose to buy though, will ultimately be depend on where you expect their prices to be in the future, right or wrong. That's what we believe right now and that will drive our investment activities. So here the same thing will happen. Which currency we choose to hold will depend to a great extent on what we expect to happen to this exchange rate in the future. All right, now, what other variables do we need to introduce here? We've got the short-term domestic interest rate paid on domestic currency deposits, and F would be the foreign rate. And I mentioned earlier, these are all Euro currency deposit rates. Okay, and just a quick review. What is a euro currency? Euro currencies are, or a euro currency is a deposit held outside the country of origin. For example, a dollar deposit held at Barclays Bank in London. <sighs> okay, at Barclays Bank in London would be a euro dollar deposit. A 
okay? Um, a deposit of pounds held at Citibank in New York City would be a euro sterling deposit. And so the same thing holds virtually all of the major Western currencies have equivalent euro um, currencies. In other words, you can have Japanese yen held in the United States and they would be called euro yen. You can have euro Swiss franc, any currency you can imagine, but mainly the, the large ones, the most important ones would be uh, traded in this euro currency market. In fact, um, you know what? It might be interesting just to be on the safe side. I wonder if we can maybe find it, a quick video about the euro currency markets. It might be useful as background for what we're doing. Let's just see what's out there. Well, this looks like fun. How Euro dollars work explained in one minute from definition and history to market importance. Oh, what the heck, let's give this one a shot. It looks exciting. Just to make sure that we truly so, understand uh, what these things are. So let me send you this link real fast. All right, let's check this out and hopefully it looks it's as good as it looks. So let's find out what we need to know about Euro dollars. All right, check it out. Thanks. All right. I thought, I mean, it was quick, but I thought it was worth watching. I mean, I think they uh, sort of got to the highlights. Very, It was very quick and easy, but I mean, um, I like it. I think I'll show that again in future classes. And so, of course, the same thing can be said for other currencies as well. As I mentioned, it's not just dollars, although that's how the market originally got started. Um, the Euros, U.S. held a lot of deposits from foreign countries. And in fact, it was the Soviet Union that really got the market started because they were nervous after World War II that they would go too far and the US would nationalize their deposits. And so they found a way to keep them in a London bank. Um, now, of course, you know the Soviet's own currency, the ruble was worthless, but they, so they needed to hold a lot of their assets in the form of dollars, but they didn't want those dollar deposits to be seized by the United States government. So they found a compromise by depositing them in a British bank, although I don't remember which one it was, and that's how the Euro dollar market really got started. And then when other people saw what was happening, 
um, people began to realize that this was a great idea. And so uh, a lot of foreign banks, especially in, in London, began to advertise that they were willing to accept euro dollar deposits and pay the euro dollar rate of interest. And so they became a very popular alternative to keeping money in American banks. And then, of course, the same thing started happening with the yen and the, and the sterling and all the rest. And before you knew it, it became a massive, massive market. It's very convenient. I mean, you can imagine as an American company, uh, imagine you're doing a lot of business in London and you earn a lot of your revenues in dollars, your expenses, some of them are in dollars, some are in uh, pounds. It's probably very convenient that you can be able to hold dollars in a British bank so that you can get at them whenever you need them. And, um, and so the same thing is true with foreign countries who do business here. It might be nice for, let's say, a, a Japanese bank in New York to have access to dollar deposits. So the market is massive. But the thing is, though, these are usually these are the rates that are being paid to large deposits held by you know large corporations. So the rate of interest reflects the fact that there's very little risk uh, associated with these deposits. And so, um, you know, you could, in theory, earn a higher rate of return from investing elsewhere. This has always been perceived as a very safe market, and the euro currency rates reflect that. Anyway, so this is the uh, rate that we'll be using in our asset market model uh, right here. So, for example, if we're analyzing the relationship between the dollar and the pound, the rates of interest will be the euro dollar deposit rate and the euro sterling deposit rate. Okay, uh, so um, hold on one second. Ah. All right, here we go. Now, why does this, now first, what we wanna ask ourselves is why does this equation hold? What exactly is it trying to show us in the first place? Well, what they're trying to do is say, listen, in equilibrium, which means that everybody is happy, uh, investors who are holding Euro dollars and investors who are holding, let's say, euro sterling are both happy. Neither one has any incentive to switch their funds into the other currency. So we call that equilibrium because there's a balance between the dollars that are being held by um, you know, some depositors and the yet sterling that are being held by the others. Now, if something changes, that could trigger a switch from dollars into pounds and vice versa. But right now, when this equation holds, we're assuming that everybody is happy with what they're holding and they'll have no reason to switch into the other currency. So in a nutshell, what this equation is saying is that in equilibrium, um, hold on, let me get this in here. Um, the equation shows that in equilibrium, the expected rate of return from holding the foreign currency matches the return to holding the domestic currency. Okay, now, of course, you notice how we only need to use the word expected with the foreign currency because the domestic currency, we know what rate of interest we're earning. With the foreign rate of uh, the foreign investment, we know what the actual interest rate is, but once we translate it back into our own currency, that is the amount that's not known for certain because the exchange rate can fluctuate over time. So if we're reasonably convinced that holding our own currency will give the same return as a foreign currency, then nobody has any real reason to shift their funds back and forth between the two currencies. But again, if one of these variables changes, well, that means that there could be a major reaction by investors in both currencies. So we think of this as our equilibrium relationship and in equilibrium, the returns to the two currencies are equal to each other. Just like in equilibrium in, uh, with a traditional supply and demand framework, the, uh, so what we have is a balance when there's an equality between quantity supply to the good and quantity demanded, because at that price, nobody has any incentive to change what they're doing. The same thing holds here. Now, um, so the foreign rate of interest is RF. Now this expression is interesting because what it represents is the expected percentage change in the exchange rate. Okay, now, uh, since again, this is not a known number, 
This is an expectation. And basically it reflects what we expect to happen to uh, that exchange rate in the future. Uh, now, for example, I think I have a numerical example down here somewhere. Um, yeah, let's jump ahead to this example real fast to remind ourselves what this looks like. If we have an investor in the US that is able to spend or invest $1,000 in for one year in a British bank account that pays 5% and the exchange rate is $2 per pound, of course, what this means is that we must convert our dollars into pounds if we really want to earn the British rate of interest. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Now, there's some US rate that we could earn for certain, but instead we want to take our chances and switch or invest our funds in sterling and earn the sterling rate of interest and hope that we end up not losing money when the exchange rate fluctuates. So we want to look at two potential scenarios that could take place in one year when it's time to bring back to our own uh, country the dollars that we've earned, or sorry, the pounds that we earned in this account. So in one case, the dollar got stronger and the other case, the dollar got weaker. Okay, so remember, we're assuming that right now <clears throat> for simplicity, the exchange rate is $2 a pound. So one of two things can happen. I mean, obviously if nothing changes, then our actual rate of return will indeed be 5%. But if not, if the exchange rate changes, our actual rate of return in dollar terms will be different. So here, for example, we have either a stronger dollar or we have a weaker dollar. Now, intuitively, you might think that we're hoping for a stronger dollar, but that actually turns out not to be the case. All right, let me fix that. Okay, so let's look at some numerical examples here. So either way, if we're gonna hold sterling or pounds, uh, we're gonna convert $1,000 into British pounds at the current spot exchange rate, which is $2 a pound. So that means we'll have 500 pounds in our British bank account. That will stay there for one year and earn the British rate of interest, which is currently 5%. So when the year is over, we're guaranteed to have 525 British pounds. Now that's wonderful, but we don't know for sure how many dollars that will be worth. So in scenario number one, with our stronger dollar, you can see the problem, we only ended up with $997.50 because each pound is worth fewer US dollars. And now we're upset because we not only did not make our 5%, but we actually lost money. Wow, that's pretty painful. We lost approximately a quarter of a percent on this deposit because the dollar got stronger. And just think what would have happened if it had gotten even stronger um, at an exchange rate of $1.80, for example, which is not impossible. I mean, currencies are very volatile. Our return, wow, look at this. We would have wound up with only $945, which is a loss of about five and a half percent. So it doesn't take much of a change in the exchange rate to wipe out our profits from this account or our interest rate. So we've gotta be really careful when we start investing our money in foreign bank accounts without covering our risks with a forward contract. Okay, so in other words, we're kind of gambling here and we're just hoping that our gamble works out. Of course, on the other hand, what if the dollar had gotten weaker and jumped up to 210? Look at the rate of return now. Now we're happy. We're, we're really happy because all of a sudden we've made more than 10%. I mean, we thought we were getting 5% and instead we got 10.25%. Not bad. So that means the weaker we expect the dollar to be in the future, the more likely we are to invest in Euro sterling, okay? Rather than, Euro, uh, than dollars or Euro dollars for that matter. So this means that that expectation will play a major role 
in where we choose to invest our money. Will it be Euro dollars or will it be Euro sterling? That depends on where we see the dollar going in one year. So again, as an American investor, the weaker we expect the dollar to be, the more likely we are to invest in Euro sterling, the stronger we expect the dollar to be, the more likely we are to invest in the Euro dollars. All right, and so that's why this term is here. Now you can see, and by the way, keep in mind, um, if you notice, uh, let's remember before we said that E is currently $2. This means, this first term means that EE, um, is negative. Okay. In this case, this term is positive. So if you look at this equation again, very carefully, you'll notice something interesting. Um, let me go find, uh, here it is. If you look at it very interest, uh, carefully, you'll see that this makes sense because uh, um, what this is telling us is that, uh, okay. there we go. Yeah, I just wanna make it all fit. It's a little tricky here. So when this term, this expectations term is positive, which it would be with a weaker dollar, that means the return on the right-hand side of this equation will be larger than it otherwise would have been. So in other words, as we expect the dollar to get weaker, this term gets larger. And since that adds to our return to the foreign currency, that makes it more attractive to invest in, in this case, British pounds. On the other hand, if we're anticipating a stronger dollar, this, re, this uh, expression is negative and that would reduce the return to the foreign currency. So that's why the equation is written this way. All right, because that means a weaker dollar returns a higher, gives us a higher return in the foreign currency, a stronger dollar does the opposite. So that's the role of this uh, term here. What do we think will happen? And of course, and I just wanna point out that if we expect um, the dollar to remain unchanged, what would that do? All right, let's find out real fast. That would mean that um, this expression would equal zero, and then the return to the two countries would just be equal. Okay, so if we don't expect any change at all. That means we may as well just keep our money wherever it is. There's no point in shifting it back and forth between the two currencies. All right, so you can see how if our expectations change, that might trigger a switch between one currency and the other. And we'll see several examples of that as we go along. All right, now. Um, all right, so anyway, this is our equilibrium. And then when we specifically want to apply this to the dollar and the pound, um, then we just change the symbols. You can see on the left-hand side, the return to the dollar and the right-hand side is the expected return to the pound. That's our equilibrium condition. Okay, now in the event that the two sides do not equal each other, we can either have a surplus or shortage of one currency or the other, just like with any traditional good that you might try to model with the traditional supply and demand curves. So what do I mean by that? Like right here, what if the exchange rate, um, oh, sorry, this is the traditional supply and demand curves. 
Um, we all recall that when the price of a good is too high, there will be a surplus. When the price of the good is too low, there will be a shortage. And of course, there will be an adjustment, meaning that the price will either go down if it's too high or up if it's too low. And that process will stop when we've reached our equilibrium position. So even if there were not, we're not in equilibrium, we will go right back to it as soon as people notice that the market is not in balance. The same thing is going to happen here. And we're going to see exactly what happens when the left-hand side and the right-hand side are not equal. And in a nutshell, if the return to holding dollars is less than the expected return to holding pounds, then investors, both American and British, will switch their deposits of dollars into deposits of pounds. It's just that simple. We start to become pessimistic. We think that the dollar return will be lower than the British pound return. Why not move our funds into the British pound and take advantage of this difference? In the process, as investors start selling their dollars and buying pounds, of course, the dollar will get weaker and the pound will get stronger until the returns are thought to be equal to each other again. All right, so it's only when there's an expected discrepancy between the returns to the two currencies that people start switching their funds back and forth. And as they do that, the exchange rate will change until the condition is going to hold again. In other words, the return should be equal in both countries. Now, of course, the opposite has to be true. If the expected return to holding pounds is less than the return to holding dollars, then the opposite should happen. In other words, um, we now want to hold dollars. We don't want to hold pounds. So investors will switch their funds from pounds to dollars. The dollar will get stronger. The pound will get weaker. And eventually this will stop when the expected returns are the same in both countries. That's when it will stop. All right, so why don't we look at a numerical example of this? And by doing so, we can derive a very interesting Cur a set of curves that will help us analyze the strength of the dollar in the short run. All right, let's take a look at this case. Suppose that th these are the numbers that we have. We've got a spot exchange rate of $1.85 a pound. The deposit rate for Euro sterling is 4%. The deposit rate for Euro dollars is 2%. Investors expect the dollar to get stronger. How do you know that, by the way? Because this number is lower than the current spot exchange rate. And of course, remember when we have dollars per pound, a higher value means a weaker dollar. A lower value means a higher, uh, stronger uh, dollar. So therefore, this tells me that investors expect the dollar to strengthen against the pound. Not that they're necessarily correct again, but this is what they believe and this will drive their investment behavior. All right. So if that's the case, then Ameri let's assume once again that we're American investors. The known return of the dollar is 2%. I can just put all my money in a Euro dollar account and lock up a 2% rate of interest. No, no problems. It's the interesting part is what about the Euro sterling? Okay, well, remember that is going to equal the expected return to the pound is going to be the sum of the British rate of interest plus that expectation term 
So what we have to do is plug in those numbers and see what happens. So when we plug in those numbers, all right, let me just go find them again. Uh, here we go. Let me move it up here. The British pound rate of interest was 4%. Now, normally that by itself would tend to attract investors to switch from dollars to pounds. But watch this. EE is only 1.813. meaning we expect a stronger dollar. Now, remember in the last example, we saw that when the dollar gets stronger, that reduces our returns to holding pounds. So if you calculate the value in the parentheses very quickly, 1.813 minus 1.85 divided by 1.85, that's exactly negative 2%. So therefore, look what happens. The return to the British pound is expected to be exactly 2%. Ah, so the returns are equal to each other. So remember up here is the expected return to the pound. Down here is the known return to the dollar. They're right now at this point in time equal to each other. That means that we are in, in equilibrium. There's no need now to switch back and forth between the two currencies because we're getting the same return either way. Everybody's happy. Okay, so. What if something changes? Okay, in other words, right now, every, everybody's happy. They're holding to the under the currency that they want. Everybody's expecting to get 2% from both currencies, but of course, something always changes, okay? These markets are very volatile. This is not likely to last for very long. So therefore, let's assume that E rises above, um, or, uh, okay, so by the way, I just wanna point out here, algebraically, let me just take a quick step backwards here. Um, I'm gonna sneak this in here. Since this equation tells me return to the two currencies. The equilibrium exchange rate can be derived from this condition. Okay, so algebraically, I'll start by subtracting off the uh, British pound rate of interest. And then what I'm trying to do is solve for E. I'm trying to solve for the equilibrium exchange rate. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by E. Now I'll add E to both sides. Oops. And now I can factor out uh, E from both of these sides. And then I can just divide out both sides by this term in uh, brackets. And I can just simplify it as R dollar minus R pounds plus one. All right, 
that is how I solve for the equilibrium exchange rates. So let me just throw those numbers in that we had and we can show that the number we were given is in fact the correct or equilibrium exchange rate. So you might recall that earlier on, we noted that the dollar exchange rate was, uh, sorry, the dollar rate was 4%, the 2%. The British pound rate is 4%. And the expected exchange rate was 1.813, um, okay. So if I plug those in, 1.813 over 0 0.02 minus 0 0.04 plus one, I've got 1.813 over one, actually this is 0 0.98. And then um, you have to take out your calculator and you've got a dollar eighty-five as your equilibrium exchange rate. Now we assumed in this problem that that is in fact the value of E. Remember way back here we said we assume that the exchange rate that we currently observe in the market is a dollar eighty-five. So what that means then is that the market is in equilibrium because that E is equal to its. Ex, um, equilibrium value. Wonderful, okay. Now, what about other cases where this is not true? Just like we saw before with our supply and demand curves, if we're not in equilibrium, prices will automatically adjust themselves to bring the market back into equilibrium. What about here? What has to happen for an adjustment to take place? So there's two possibilities. E could be too high or too low to be consistent with market equilibrium. All right, well, let's try, try the first case, E is too high. Let's jump ahead here and look at the numerical example of what happens if E is greater than $1.85, like $1.86. What we're going to do here is take our equation. Now, of course, the US return hasn't changed. Let's get this out of here. It's the expected return to the British pound that's going to be different. Okay, so in other words, if you look at this equation, you'll see that the left-hand side hasn't changed. But if you look at the right-hand side, right here, if you plug in the, those numbers, and by the way, this is the new value of E. It's too high. What does that imply about the return to the pound? If you look at this, these numbers, you'll see all of a sudden, we're only getting 1.5% in British pounds when we can get $2, 2% uh, 2 rather from the US dollar. Therefore, at this point in time, in the eyes of investors throughout the world, holding Euro dollars is more attractive than holding Euro sterling. And so how will people react to that? Well, they wanna get in on the action too they want to earn the higher US dollar rate. So how do they earn it though? The only way they can do that is to sell their sterling holdings and use them to invest more in Euro dollars. And that's exactly what will happen. All right, so the investors throughout the world will notice this immediately They'll say, wait a minute, we could do better by holding Euro dollars than Euro, uh, Euro sterling. Oh my God. So the left-hand side of this equation is greater than the right-hand side. Investing in the US is now more attractive than the UK. 
investors will switch. from euro dollar uh, sterling to euro dollars and so when that happens what's going to happen to e so they will draw their funds from uk euro sterling deposits And they'll invest in euro dollars. Now, just think about this. Investors are selling sterling. And they're buying euro dollars. In the process, the pound weakens and the dollar strengthens. And since the exchange rate is so quoted as dollars per pound, that means that the exchange rate has to go down. And when will it stop falling? When it returns to the correct equilibrium value of 185. Okay, so in other words, when, if it go, jumps up to 186, investors will react by selling sterling and buying dollars. And what will happen is E will fall back down to its correct or equilibrium level. And then all of this stops. There's now no longer any need for anybody to sell or buy any currencies because now the returns to both countries are the same. In other words, 2%. All right. Well, you can probably guess what's going to happen if E is too low. In other words, if the dollar is too strong to be in equilibrium, all of this will work backwards. So what if E is instead of too high, it's too low? Well, we just reverse all of these steps. So when that happens, um, we know that if this goes to $1.84, the return to dollars is still 2%, but all of a sudden, look what happens to sterling. With that lower exchange rate here, ah, look at that. The rate of return to holding sterling is now up to 2.5%. Now the shoe is on the other foot. Suddenly, it's the British pound that's more attractive than the dollar. And naturally enough, investors will sell their dollars to buy pounds. We're all looking out the highest rate of return. And in a moment's notice, they'll suddenly switch their funds out of those dollars and into pounds. Okay, because we're getting less of a return from the dollar than the pound. We don't like that, do we? No. We want to make sure we're always earning the highest possible rate of return, and that is no longer in dollars. Now, Right, so in other words, the return to the sterling exceeds the return to the dollar. Now, in order for investors to invest more in euro sterling and less in dollars, that's the only way they can do it. They have to sell off some of their dollar deposits and convert them into British pounds. Okay, so when that happens, I'll mention, I'll write that up here. They'll sell euro dollars.
and of course by euro sterling. Okay. And that means that dollars get weaker. And the pound appreciates. So E, the exchange rate, because the dollar's weakening, E will rise. to a dollar, its proper level, which is a dollar 85 per pound. And then it will stop because now, once again, the returns are the same in both countries. Okay, and like I said, until equilibrium is reestablished, which means of course that the US return is still two and the UK return is two. Okay, so then equilibrium will be reestablished. Anyway, so what I did here was I put together a chart so you can see all of this happening all at once. So let's take a look at this chart. So you can see all the calculations that have already been done for you. So you can see the relationships between uh, changes in these rates and the equilibrium. So, all right, so here we already know the bold face in the middle this is where we are at equilibrium. This is the first case we looked at. When E gets too high, as we saw, the dollar return, which is always 2%, exceeds the British pound return, which is right here. Remember, this is the Euro dollar, uh, sterling return. Oh, sorry, wrote the wrong thing. And that's what we're comparing. In other words, the comparison that we need is between the first and the last column. The other columns are there just to show us how that was derived, but the first column, the return to the dollar is never going to change. All right, that's a fixed constant right now. So we'll call that the Euro dollar return. And then all the rest of these are just intermediate calculations. The columns that really matter are these two. In fact, why don't I highlight these so we can see them. A little bit clearer. And so this is what investors are looking at in the marketplace. Okay, so in other words, in cases where the US return is higher than the UK return, what do they all have in common? It doesn't matter how much higher, what they have in common is that down here, below, let's say I'll draw a line here. The dollar has become more attractive than the pound. And naturally enough, people will buy dollars, they'll sell pounds, and the exchange rate will fall until we return to the equilibrium level right here at $1.85. All right, that's where the market is in equilibrium. On the other hand, anywhere above that point, when, um, when we're at, let's say 184 and 183, which we saw in the slides, you can see on the left-hand side, the US rate of return is only 2%. The foreign rate or the British rate in this case is going up 
that means people want to buy pounds and sell dollars. And in the process, the exchange, the exchange rate rises to the equilibrium level, which is $1.85. So for anywhere other than 185, the markets will react automatically and bring us back into equilibrium. Okay, so now with all that being said, we can now define some curves that correspond to supply and demand curves. So we can see this at a glance, um, not just, we don't have to do all these calculations every single time. It should be possible to draw a graph where we can visualize exactly what's happening here. So it will look a lot like traditional supply and demand curves when we're done with it. What we're gonna show though is first, from the US investor's perspective, I've got on the vertical axis, the dollar pound exchange rate. Across the horizontal axis, I have the rate of return. So it turns out that in the US, uh, actually this, this curve, it doesn't actually say that here, does it? This curve is meant to represent the return I'll make a note of it right here. This curve represents the return to Euro uh, sterling. Okay, it's downward sloping, just like any supply uh, demand curve you've ever seen. So th these numbers are taken from the chart. This is equilibrium. Okay, 2% US return occurs um, in Britain when we have an exchange rate of 185. When the exchange rate went up to 186, as you can see here, the UK rate of return dropped to 1.5%. Okay. And then at the other extreme, when the exchange rate went down to 184, uh, right here, you can see that the return to Euro sterling went up to 2.5%. So this is why the curve is downward sloping. With a low exchange rate, the return to the Euro dollar, uh, sterling rather goes up and vice versa. And so those are three points from that chart. And you can see this curve will always be downward sloping. All right, and so don't forget, what this is meant to represent, this is the return to holding Euro sterling. Now the return to dollars is easy. Um, basically the return to dollars is not affected by this exchange rate. It's a fixed constant. So therefore it will be a vertical line and, and remember, it was 2%. So this is the return to dollars or Euro dollars, I should say. And down here is the return to Euro sterling. And so where they cross, of course, is our equilibrium exchange rate and our equilibrium rate of return. That's where they cross, this is it. And this is what we uh, saw earlier with our calculations. What if we're not in equilibrium? What happens? Now we've already seen this with the charts. Let's just do this now with the graphs and you can see it'll work out exactly the same. For example, what if the exchange rate is 186? We already saw this case. At 186, remember the return to the, uh, to the Euro dollar is too low. Uh, sorry, to the Euro sterling is too low. 
okay? So right here, you can see the return to the Euro dollar exceeds the return to the Euro sterling. The dollar gets stronger and therefore it drops back down to the equilibrium level of 185 automatically. Down here at 184, we saw this case as well. When uh, the exchange rate is a dollar 84, that means that the return to the euro dollar, uh, sorry, euro sterling is greater than for euro dollars. And that causes the dollar to get weaker. Or in other words, the exchange rate goes up. And that's exactly what's happening here. Okay, so we get down to this neighborhood. There's a tendency, automatic tendency, for the exchange rate to rise back to its correct or equilibrium value. So either way, if the exchange rate is not at a dollar eighty-five, if it's too high, it'll fall. If it's too low, it'll rise until we're back where we belong in equilibrium. Okay, that's what we're aiming for. And so just like with traditional supply and demand curves, uh, there's an automatic tendency to remove, to be in equilibrium. If we're not in equilibrium, adjustments will take place until we find ourselves back in equilibrium. Okay, so now what do we need to analyze? Well, what happens if there's a change in one of these curves? What would that do to our equilibrium exchange rate? Now, that's an important question because you know these variables can change very quickly and very easily. And we need to understand how that affects the strength of the dollar and the pound. All right, so how does that go? Well, first of all, let's remind ourselves that with traditional supply and demand curves, if there's an increase in demand, the price of the good goes up and the quantity goes up because the demand curve shifts to the right. On the other hand, if there is a decrease in the demand for this product, everything works in reverse. Of course it does, it has to. In other words, the demand curve would shift to the left and that would reduce both the price and the quantity. Well, how does that, oh, and I did, I guess I did all four of them. With an increase in supply, that means that the supply curve shifts to the right, the price of the good drops and the quantity goes up. And then finally, a decrease in the supply means the opposite. The supply curve shifts to the left and the price goes up and the quantity goes down. So something similar will happen here with these two curves. Even though they're technically not supply and demand curves, the movement of the curves is exactly the same. All right, so any way you look at it, if there's a change in any of these variables, the curves will shift and we'll find ourselves with a new equilibrium exchange rate as well as a new equilibrium rate of return in the two markets. How does that work though? What can cause any of these changes to happen? So there are three things that can cause one of these curves to shift. A change in what we'll call the domestic rate of interest, which in our example means the Euro dollar deposit rate. A change in the foreign interest rate, which means in our case, the Euro sterling deposit rate. And of course, expectations of future exchange rates. Those can change at a moment's notice, as you can imagine. So they may be responsible for a lot of the volatility in the foreign exchange markets. All right, so what we're gonna do is consider one at a time, what happens to um, the equilibrium position when there's a change in one of these variables. Now, Let's begin by looking at the first case. And let's recall that when there's an increase in a variable, then one of the curves has to shift to the right, whereas a decrease represents a shift to the left. So let's say this is our starting point. 
We've got our equilibrium exchange rate. This is the US rate of return. This is the UK rate of return. What happens if the US rate of interest goes up or down? Let's find out. How about the first case? What if the US dollar rate goes up? Let's say the Federal Reserve gets together and they decide to raise rates. What influence will that have on the equilibrium exchange rate? Well, first things first, which curve is going to shift and in which direction? If there's an increase in US rates, no, oh, we've got to think about that for a second. Well, obviously, the curve that's being affected is the dollar, US dollar rate return. And because we know that increases mean a shift to the right, that implies that this will result in a shift to the right of the dollar interest rate curve. But then what will the new equilibrium position look like? So just as a numerical example, Let's assume, going back to our original data, with all the same numbers we had before, what if the US rate goes up to 3%? What happens to the equilibrium exchange rate? All right, well, we'll plug in the numbers. And let's see. What this means is that the dollar return now exceeds the pound return because nothing changed on the right-hand side. So in the US, you can get 3% from your Euro dollar deposits. In um, England, you can get only 2% on your Euro sterling accounts. So you know perfectly well what's going to happen. Investors will quickly sell pounds to buy dollars and in the process establish a new equilibrium exchange rate, one where the exchange rate um, or the dollar rather is stronger. So let's prove this mathematically. What happens here is that we have to take, now remember, by the way, I just wanna remind you, um, the formula for the equilibrium exchange rate is this. So just looking at this algebraically, if our dollar increases, I'll use an arrow here for that, the denominator increases and that means the entire ratio decreases. And of course, that means E is falling, which means a stronger dollar. So that's a key insight. A higher US rate of interest strengthens the dollar. And of course you can see why, because it means investors are buying dollars to get take advantage of the higher interest rates in the United States. So that's an important detail a higher US rate of interest will strengthen the dollar. But here we'd like to calculate the exact value of that new exchange rate. And so we can do that because we have all the numbers that we need. And if you plug them in, what will you see? You'll see a lower E, but let's find out exactly how low it gets. All right, 1.831 is the new equilibrium exchange rate instead of a dollar 85. So in other words, we plug those numbers in and just as we predicted, the dollar has appreciated from 185 to 1831 following that rise in US interest rates. Now, how do we show this on the graph? Well, remember we did say that when a curve or anything increases, the curve shifts to the right. And so that will happen here as well. All right, and then where it crosses the unchanged return to the pound curve, you'll see a lower value of E. And in fact, it'll fall all the way to 183.1 for the
for the equilibrium exchange rate. All right. So this is what it would look like. Oh, here we go. Ah, exactly. So in other words, it shifted to the right. And at the new intersection between the new US dollar rate and the existing uh, Euro sterling rate, we'll find that the dollar has gotten stronger and the rate of return to both currencies is now the same again at 3%. Okay, so higher rates in the US lead to a stronger dollar, or you can think of it also as a weaker pound. Now, obviously, then it should be clear that a decrease in the US rate will have the opposite effect. What if we started back at our original position of 2% in the US? What happens if I lower the US rate of interest to let's say 1%? Well, I'm sure you can visualize what's going to happen. Um, but let, why don't, while we're at it, why don't we figure out the new equilibrium exchange rate? So we plug in our numbers. And at the moment, you can see that the UK rate on the right-hand side is now more attractive than the US rate on the left-hand side. So in other words, the weaker, the lower US rate of interest means that investors are shifting their funds from dollars into pounds. The pound therefore must appreciate and the dollar must depreciate. The question is, what is the new equilibrium exchange rate? And yes, so as I said, because of this, investors are buying pounds and they're selling dollars. And so when you plug in these new numbers, the equilibrium exchange rate rises all the way to a dollar 86.9 compared to the original value of 185, which means there's a weaker dollar. All right. Oh, nobody should be surprised by that. And so now, This is what the graph looks like. The curve, the dollar return shifts to the left. And now all of a sudden we have a weaker dollar and each country now has the same lower return at 1%. just the opposite of what we just saw. Now there's two, I did mention, there's two other factors that could change on this graph. Both of them involve the British pound. We could see a change in the British rate of interest. We could also see a change in expectations. And of course, both of those will affect this curve as opposed to the US dollar curve. So what's going to happen now, based on the logic we just saw, it appears that higher interest rates are beneficial to a currency. And you'll see that that's exactly correct. So imagine we go back to our original data and all of a sudden the UK rate of interest jumps up to 5%. Okay, so base, starting from here, suppose the UK rate rises to 5% or 0.05. What happens as a result? Well, we can predict in advance that the dollar will get weaker and the pound will get stronger because investors are well, we may as well make a note of it here. Investors will buy pounds and sell dollars and the dollar will depreciate.
Okay, and that's exactly what's going to happen. The question is, again, how far up is the exchange rate going? All right, well, we plug in our numbers and we're gonna see when the UK rate goes up to 5%, the new equilibrium exchange rate is 1.869 up from $1.85. So indeed the dollar is weaker than it was before. All right, so what happens to our graph then? What curve is shifting in what direction? Oh, good question. I know, how about if the whole thing shifts to the right? Okay, and this is the result of the UK rate increasing. So because of that, at our new equilibrium, equilibrium exchange rate, the dollar has gotten weaker. US, the rate hasn't changed, but the dollar got weaker. All right, now if we are able to show the an increase in the UK rate of interest or the Euro dollar, uh, Euro sterling rate, we can just as easily show a decrease in the same rate. And of course you would expect everything to work backwards and that is exactly correct. Okay, if the UK rate goes down, people will buy more dollars and before you know it, the dollar will be stronger. Let's see how that works. All right, so now remember, originally the UK rate was four. Let's say it now drops to three. So suddenly US rate exceeds the UK rate and people will buy dollars and sell pounds until we reach the new equilibrium exchange rate, which is 183.1 dollars per pound compared with 185 originally and so you can imagine that that entire curve that we saw earlier shifting to the right will now shift to the left. All right, so let's take a look. All right, and again, this is what's causing it right here. All right, so you'll probably not be surprised to discover that the entire curve shifts to the left for the British pound. And when it does, we have a stronger dollar and a weaker pound, and we find ourselves here at 183.1 compared to our starting point of 185. So the dollar benefits when UK rates drop and the dollar is hurt when UK rates rise. Okay. Now, finally, the one thing we haven't thought about yet is expectations. Here we have to be a little careful to understand what this actually means. Um, if this EE goes up, that means investors are more pessimistic about the dollar because they're expecting it to rise in the future. So just keep that in mind. Uh, a rise in this EE term means we expect a weaker dollar, but of course that also means that if EE falls, investors are expecting the dollar to get stronger. Now, it turns out, interestingly enough, we're going to see in a few minutes that if investors expect a stronger dollar, the dollar will get stronger just because investors expect it to happen. And if investors expect the dollar to get weaker, then that's exactly what's going to happen. 
And in fact, you may have heard of this before. This is called a self-fulfilling prophecy, which means that something happens because you predicted it would happen. A self-fulfilling prophecy and that's exactly what we're seeing here. If we start to think, well, you know, the dollar will probably go down next year, then the result of that is that you would sell your dollars. And of course, then it actually does start to depreciate. All right, let's just show this numerically. Um, and there's, a, by the way, there's a lot of reasons why this could happen. Um, for example, uh, expectations are very different than interest rates because these are affected by psychology. So what could happen to make us have a better outlook on the dollar? How about things like these, falling inflation, rising interest rates, uh, faster economic growth, falling international tensions. Any of these could cause us to think the dollar will get stronger. And you know, let's face it, our opinions can change very quickly. And this is one reason why currencies are so volatile. On the other hand, if any of these works in the opposite direction, then you would expect, uh, of course, people will become more pessimistic about the dollar. If we just reverse any of these, like for example, rising inflation or falling interest rates or slower growth or rising tensions, any of those could cause the dollar or at least our expectations to go um, to move towards pessimism, which means we expect a weaker dollar. All right, so let's just quickly show these last two cases. Um, first, we'll start with our original data. And let's say, um, let's assume that investors become more pessimistic. Therefore, EE -E -E goes up, all right? Specifically, let's say that they go up to $1.83. All the question is, what does that do to the rate of return that we can earn from holding British pounds relative to dollars? So if you plug in those numbers, you'll see that that is actually making the pound more attractive. The exchange rate rises to a dollar 0.867. And just as we predicted, more pessimism about the dollar is causing it to get weaker because people start selling dollars. Now that means that um, of these two curves, the one that shifts is the one that shows the returns to the pound and specifically it shifts to the right. Okay, it shifts to the right. And when it does, you'll see the dollar gets weaker. Okay, so this number went from 180, was it 185? No, 1.813 up to 1.85, no, 1.83. And the result is a weaker dollar. Now, obviously what's coming next is that we're going to see what happens when investors become more optimistic about the dollar. So this EE will have to drop and you'll expect to see, and you'll be correct and note that this whole curve will shift to the left and we'll find ourselves with a stronger dollar. So imagine that EE drops to $1.80. Okay, so let's come back here. So right here, And the result is that E is lower, which means a stronger dollar.
And that means that that curve representing the return to the pound must shift to the left. And yes, it did. So again, here, this went from 1.813 to 1.8. Oh, and that's all it took to move the curve to the left. And all of a sudden, the dollar just got stronger. So that's all the cases that we have here, although we're going to get a lot of mileage out of this framework when we start analyzing um, the Federal Reserve System and that type of thing and see how their actions can affect uh, the dollar and the return to the uh, the foreign currency, the return to the dollar and all the rest. So this framework will get a lot of mileage out of it as we start to analyze what happens in the foreign exchange markets due to other factors like changes in central bank policy. But not just yet, that will have to wait for another day. In the meantime, let's not forget, if you go back to Moodle, you'll see that, um, Right there, staring in the face is that old midterm, which is basically a similar, it's kind of similar to what we've already done, but, um, and it's a little bit shorter, you know, I didn't want it to take forever, but you can hand it in a week from Thursday, uh, yeah, a week from Thursday at midnight, that should be more than enough time, all right? Yeah, when you're done, take, you can take a picture of them and email them to my uh, email account. No, there's no place in Moodle that I'm aware of where you can put it. So uh, either do that, or if you own a proper printer or scanner, you can actually scan it into a PDF file and email it to me. But either way, you should email it back to me. Okay. All right. Now, by the way, I just want to mention one other thing in passing. Um, it looks like my inbox at purchase is getting pretty full. If you're if you send it to me and it gets kicked back, just send it to my personal email account, the one that I use to send you your invitations. Okay, um, and so just keep an eye out for that, because sometimes those messages don't get back to you for quite a while. Just make sure, because I know that I just got a message this morning telling me that I'm just about out of space. So yeah, yeah. So if that happens to you, um, just send it back to me on my personal account. Either way, um, I should have a record of it. In the meantime, I'm gonna try to uh, uh, delete some of my old mail and make sure that doesn't happen to you. But if it does, you can feel free to just send it to the other account, okay? Other than that, I think we're all set and I'll see you all next Monday. Thank you, have a good weekend. You're welcome. Okay, bye.